If, if, only, if I can only pull myself onto my front, if I can pull myself onto my front, and his legs and his arms are waving frantically, and if I can pull myself onto my front, I can get onto the floor, because... Happy to see you all. And I'm here to talk a little bit about our dear friend and devoted and most beloved author Franz Kafka, who I'm sure all of you know quite well, probably a lot of you better than I do. So all I can talk about is my experience with him, how I absorbed a Kafka within my own being and how I identified with him and um, how he meant so much to me. When I first read him, I was just so taken aback because unlike most authors that build to a climax using a, a huge amount of detail and references and, and, and narrative and experience building up eventually boiling like a kettle to a climax, Franz Kafka seems to start, he starts his work with a climax. So, so many of his plays of books, stories, begin with a climax. So, it's like in the trial when he said, somebody must have been lying about Joseph K. For without having done anything wrong, he was arrested one fine morning. The landlady's cook, who normally brought his breakfast at eight o'clock, failed to appear. That had never happened before. Kay waited a moment longer. People opposite were staring at him with distinct curiosity. So he starts with a climax before, before the people, the detectives, the police gradually encircle him. Same with <coughs> metamorphosis. Gregor Sam's uh, woke from a night of uneasy dreams and found himself transformed in his bed into a gigantic insect. His numerous legs, which were pitifully thin compared to the rest of his bulk, waved helplessly before him. Ah, oh, wow! What's happened to me? He thought it was no dream. He looked at the uh, alarm clock ticking on the chest. Half past six and the hands were quietly moving on. Oh, Gregor, said a voice. That gentle voice. It was his mother's. The devotion of the mother to son is so strong in Kafka's work. Very, very strong. Obviously, particularly more in metamorphosis. When his mother really is the only she nourishes him, succours him, defends him, protects him, stands up for him. His mother is everything in the world to him. He relies on his mother and he also relies on his sister Greta, his lovely sister Greta, who he is paying from his work to go to the academy in wherever it is, Vienna, Prague, studying the violin. And yet, Frank Kafka, or uh, as he is the Beatle, Gregor Samsa, has been working every day, going to work, packing his samples in his bag, traveling on the train and the bus, day after day, day after day, to earn enough money to pay for Greta, his sister's violin lessons and keeping the family, because his father, Mr. Samsa, or in real life, his real father, Herman Samsa, was a very gritty, gravelly man. He was a very tough man. He had a little, little kind of small, tiny wholesale business in the square in front of Prague, the Prague Cathedral, where he sold bric-a-brac and knick-knacks and, and bits of kind of kitchen parts and cups and saucers and all sorts of little things and he was a hard worker. He was a hard, dedicated worker and he, he never spared himself, never took a day off. And he was tough, he was strong. And he saw in Frank Kafka, he saw this weak, febrile, delicate, sensitive, curious, is this my, is this my son? 
It is this curious, sensitive, oh, overweening, oh, over careful, so nervous, oh, just sitting in his little room writing poetry. This my son? Oh, God, he liked to associate with other writers and artists and sensitive people. And Herman wanted him, of course, to be part of the business, be part of, as they call, part of the Geschäft, so he could work and support his father, be a mensch, work with him, so his father could be proud of him, could introduce him. And instead, he seems to be producing this rather ungainly, highly sensitive, curious, bizarre creature who stays in his little room, reading omnivorously, writing endlessly and he thinks what what is this stuff he's writing i mean well what is peculiar what is this putrid things he's writing it's horrible and one day uh, franz kafka wrote a, a letter to his dad he wanted to show his dad what he felt he wanted to be to bear himself to be naked and it's something we very rarely do in front of our fathers i never spoke to my father his, his entire life i don't think i exchanged more than one or two sentences at a time throughout his entire life except at the end at the very end and so he wanted to write a letter to explain to divulge to in a way expiate to expel what he was feeling, and he said to his father, I know, I know, I know I disappoint you, I know you're disappointed in me, I know that I don't fulfill your expectations, and I know that somehow in your eyes, and somehow in your eyes you see me as some kind of insect. You have no more respect for me than you would for an insect that you crush. And he dared to say this, dared to say this to his father, and his father couldn't understand this letter. It was bizarre. It was just, just unfathomable. But he had to bear this letter, he had to tell. And this letter perhaps was the germ that may have led to him writing one of the most notorious, most fantastic, most bizarre, most surrealistic, most uncanny, most dreamlike stories that has ever been written. And yet writing it with such forensic detail with such care, every single blade of grass is counted, every little gem, every crumb, as he describes when he wakes up in the morning, and you can see the segments of his belly, and on the segments are little spots, and near the spots is a kind of shell, and outside the shell is a kind of rib cage, and outside this rib cage are other little tiny mini spots, and the legs are kind of too small for his body, and he's, he's laying there on his back, and he thinks to himself, oh, 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 if, if, only, if I can only pull myself onto my front, if I can pull myself onto my front, and his legs and his arms are waving frantically, and if I can pull myself onto my front, I can get onto the floor, because the family are alarmed. They're saying, Gregor, Gregor, it's half past six. It's half past six already, Gregor. Isn't it time to get up? Gregor. And Greta, the sister, Gregor, Gregor, what's wrong? What's wrong, Gregor? Do you, are you ill? Are, are you needing something? Each pleading, each knocking on the door, each rapping on the door, as if the door would be the signal, the Morse code to him, opening the door, revealing himself. He must reveal himself, because why has he suddenly stayed in his room, not getting up, and he has never done this in years, not in all the years, nor the days, nor the nights, nor the weeks, nor the months, he's never, he has never stayed in his room, he has never refused to get up, never, 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 so what? What could be going on? But Gregor knows only if he could, he's on the bed, he's on the bed and his legs are waving frantically, he's trying trying to make sense of them, trying to find some, some coordination. And then he can't, he's finding it difficult, but he rocks. Ah, he rocks, he has control of his rocking. And he rocks and rocks and then suddenly slides off the bed, bang! 
and they hear that. Oh, Gregor, Gregor, are you all right? Are you all right, Gregor? Now, the reason they can't get in is because he has locked the door. He has locked the door in his own bedroom. Now, even I, even with my, my father, I never locked the door. But he's locked the door in his own bedroom as if he was living with aliens, as if he was living with warders, as if he was living with sadistic SS. He has locked the door. So how can they get in? They can't get in. They're trapped. They're absolutely, as we say, I'm trying to think of the word in German. Beseitgist, is that it? They are astonished. They can't get in. And so that Gregor thinks, the only way is for me to get onto the floor. I'll crawl along the floor, and then I'll crawl up. I'll crawl up the door, and then if I crawl up the door slowly, slowly, because he has sticky pads here, and these sticky pads <coughs> enable him to hold on, and the sticky pads, he reaches the key, opens his jaw wide, fastens it on the key, and then goes, <coughs> it hurts his jaw, my God. Oh, if it's me, that is painful. But still, he keeps on, keeps on. Then the key opens. The key snaps back. And then the door slowly opens. And maybe Greta just pulls it a little bit more. And they see this poor thing has fallen back on his little feet with a bit of gooey stuff dripping out of his jaw. And that's what they see. That's what they see. They see a huge, unbelievable, monstrous insect. <coughs> Huge, it's just uh, sickening, beyond belief. It's beyond belief. They're frozen. They're frozen. Now, what is brilliant about Franz Kafka is that he doesn't think in a linear fashion. He doesn't think in a naturalistic or realistic fashion. Reality to him is merely merely if you like the outer layer merely the skin realism is merely the kind of i wish there was the right word for it but it's somehow the trivial kind of outer husk of real life it's just what we do we eat we drink we get married we jump on the bus we sit at the table, we're eating, we, we talk, we discuss, we write letters, we complain, we're sick, we have babies. Realism. And I've noticed that in spite of England and even Scotland having some very skilled writers, very skilled dramatists, novelists, poets, they are in a way at the end of that spectrum of realism where they feel if they put a character on stage that is real that it will touch us and we will somehow feel for them so if they put do something like anything of any play i'm trying to think of something maybe like a usually no new play long day's journey into night the two sons are frustrated they have ambitions and dreams but they can't be fulfilled because the father maybe has uh, been too self-obsessed with his own life. As an actor, he was a great actor, the elder O'Neill. And the sons are frustrated. One wants to be in the Navy. He talks about that and 
the wife is a drunkard and she's always drinking to cover up her kind of she has some problem palsy and she's taking pills every day and she's getting hooked on these pills so this is what we see this is what we see on the stage this is the banality of the outer skin but what someone like Kafka what someone like even as a painter Dali with someone like Stravinsky, as someone like even our own beautiful Dylan Thomas, or like our own George Orwell, penetrates beneath the skin. It is surreal. It is a dream. We investigate our inner lives, our unconscious life, those dreams we have at night, which don't quite make sense, because time and space have congealed, twisted, so there is no reality we discuss in our works the inner mind the torments and what are they they are somehow illustrated in dreams symbolically of course the dream wants to teach us something so it symbolizes the act to continue watching this video click the link in the top left or in the description below or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.